Thank you. Um, thank you once again to uh, Dr. Bansi Sabu, and it's really great to see so many of my friends from India and across the world in the audience. I just wanted to talk a little bit about type 2 diabetes in Indian teens, uh, as it twice as bad. And I, I was remarking to Banshi that I find it very ironical that a guy from Singapore is supposed to be talking about uh, this topic about, uh, from India. How do I work this? Now, this is an American study, and it showed that over the last decade from 2001 to 2009, while type 1 diabetes has increased uh, in the US, type 2 diabetes has increased about 30%. Is this uh, America alone? No. I think it's been there all over the world. The, the question is whether the base is big or the base is small, but I think as we start to recognize this problem, I think we will see more. And I want to discuss not only a little bit about the management of type 2 diabetes in uh, teens, but also about what we might want to do to prevent it. So, um, there have been many ways to talk about uh, type 2 diabetes and definitions. ISPAD has uh, a very good write up in its web page. But I just summarized a little bit from a recent article from the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, defining it as diabetes in the child who is overweight, has a strong family history of diabetes, has substantial residual insulin capacity, insidious onset, evidence of insulin resistance, maybe polycystic ovaries, uh, androgen excess syndrome, or acanthosis nigricans, and lacks the evidence for diabetic autoimmunity. Although I would like to say that some kids with type 2 diabetes may have uh, uh, diabetes antibodies, and they're more likely to have hypertension and dyslipidemia. And of course, diabetes is defined the usual way. The American Academy of Pediatrics also uh, has recommended um, what I think is actually very sensible advice, and which is to start insulin therapy for children and adolescents with type 2 diabetes who are clearly ketotic or in DKA, and Dr. Ragnar has talked about uh, DKA, uh, and start insulin when it's not very clear whether the child has type 1 or type 2 diabetes, because insulin will always work. And in all other instances where it's mild or asymptomatic, you want to initiate lifestyle modification, including life, uh, nutrition and exercise, but always think of metformin as the first-line therapy for children and adolescents at the time of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes where possible. I advise you to get a UE as well. Uh, now, this has been an increasing problem because in the US now, up to one in three new cases of diabetes mellitus at less than 18 years of age is now type 2 diabetes. And in Asia, in, in uh, many countries, if you've got a teen Asia presenting with diabetes, it may be about two to four times more likely to be type 2 than type 1. In the US, they found that children as young as five years may have type 2 diabetes. Certainly in Singapore, we see a few cases below the age of 10. So this is an international phenomenon, and the question is, why is this happening? Let me just take you through a typical case of type 2 diabetes. Uh, this was a Caucasian girl who appeared in my practice in Singapore, but actually I think her story is very similar to many, whether Asian or otherwise. So this was a 15-year-old girl, uh, Caucasian, originally with an obese BMI. She presented with urgency, frequency, and pain on micturition for about eight months prior. And she had also lost 10 kilograms of weight. Since she was a teenage girl and she had been trying to diet, she thought, wow, this is great. My exercise and diet are finally working. However, we noted that his, her father, his four sisters, and the paternal grandfather were all known to have type 2 diabetes. This is a Caucasian family. They were all on metformin. But at the same time, father's brother, had type 1 diabetes and was actually on an insulin pump. This girl's birth history was normal. She was full-term normal vaginal delivery. Um, her birth weight was 3 kilos. She was a plump preteen 
But Minaki was early at about 10 years. Sorry about the typo. On examination, I noted that she did not have acanthosis uh, and her puberty was complete. She was actually still obese by BMI. Her GP did an OGDT uh, because he wasn't quite sure, but it connected all the dots. Her fasting glucose was high, her two-hour glucose was high, her one-hour glucose was high. However, her HbA1c was not very high and there were no ketones on the dipstick. So he commenced her on diet and exercise and she initially responded well for the first few months. Fasting glucose was 5 to 6, post-meal glucose readings 7 to 11. Not bad. One of the things her parents also noted and were puzzled also was because she used to complain of hunger after meals. And in fact, on a few occasions, she tested relatively low sugars about two to three hours after a meal. And the father and his sisters also had this before. In fact, sometimes they actually went hypo. The father found that having low carb meals actually reduced the problem. And it illustrates the point that reactive hypoglycemia can accompany or predate type 2 diabetes. And this may be due to delayed and persistent rise in insulin levels or the impaired rise of glucagon and growth hormone. Now, as in this case, as in other cases, type 2 diabetes in kids often improves with initial metformin, but then gets worse. So yes, this girl had diet and exercise initially. She had a repeat uh, blood glucose test because she came to see me. She couldn't figure out what was happening. Why was she getting hypoglycemia? Was the original diagnosis wrong? No. Actually, what happened was that um, she was actually deteriorating. And when we did her glucose OGTT with insulin levels, we realized that she was able to make insulin, but not enough, clearly not enough for an insulin resistant child. So I started her on basal bolus insulin at a very modest dose of about 0.5 units per kilo per day. And within two weeks, she was having much lower doses and I actually put her on a low dose of metformin. However, she developed hypoglycemic episodes and within another two weeks, the doses were adjusted down to 0.2 units per kilo per day, very, very small units of Novorapid and Levomir and switched finally to Levomir so to reduce her, her injection burden. But again, within four months from diagnosis, frequent and recurrent hypo episodes made the parents abandon insulin injections. And at this time, her HB1C was 6% and I put her on oral metformin. So for the next two years that she lived in Singapore, she was on oral medications but occasionally needed insulin when having flu and fever or when stressed out during exams and school projects. So hers is actually quite a typical uh, uh, history and there are some learning points here. Firstly, that type 1 and type 2 diabetes can coexist in the same extended family and sometimes they can ex even uh, exist in the same child. So, right? so you can have a type 1 diabetes child with a type 2 phenotype. These are the children who need 2 units per kilogram sometimes, right? and they're born SGA. Now, post-meal hypoglycemia is also sometimes seen in type 2 diabetes and in pre-diabetic uh, states. We talked about that. Instant should be a first-line therapy for children and adolescents with type 2 diabetes who are in DKA, who have decompensated and have high sugars, or when HbA1c is too high. In all other cases, we can use metformin. There are newer drugs, but right now only metformin is really recognized. But the choice to use met insulin or metformin in the adolescent type 2 diabetic patient can be a dynamic decision based on children's needs and you can actually have to switch from oral to insulin to oral to insulin from time to time. But it is worthwhile, I don't have the slide here, to remember that research uh, by Aslanian's group and uh, Sonia Capro's group has shown that actually the insulin secretion rate uh, or reserve in type 2 diabetes in childhood can deteriorate by 15% per annum, whereas in adult diabetics, the drop is more like 3 to 5% per annum.
So these kids actually can decompensate and lose insulin secretory reserve very quickly. Now, a little bit more about demographics. Childhood obesity is rising in almost all countries. In some countries, it has been stable uh, after a rise, like in Singapore. Uh, but it's about 12%, 13% in Singapore. Now, in India overall, I'm told that it's risen from 5 to 6.6% over a very short period of time. But I think this hides another fact, and that is in your metro situation, that about a quarter of the children are obese. So this is appro approximating American standards, where about 30% of the kids are obese in many situations, right? So in poorer families, yes, it's 11%. In richer families, it's like 29%. Um, you're not the only country. In Vietnam, it was also the same. After reunification, the North Vietnam, the former North Vietnam had about 4% obesity in children. The former South Vietnam, it was close to 12%. Okay. Yeah, okay, so we talked about Delhi, but Chennai also has the same sort of issue, right? About 20% of the children in the private schools are obese, compared to about 3% in the government schools, right? But just because they're less obese doesn't mean that you don't have that much problems. Although we say that in obese children, in your context, about 20% of them will have hypertension. In other American studies, it's closer to 11% of obese children. So there's something different about Indian obese children as well. Now, how about glucose intolerance? Well, overall, about 4% of your children uh, uh, have a glucose intolerance, okay? But somehow the girls have more. And girls with abdominal obesity have about 12.7% glucose intolerance. And that is the rate of prevalence of IGT in middle-aged uh, people in many other countries, right? These are teenage girls we're talking about. The other thing is that all over the world, if you have IGT as a teenager, there is progression to diabetes. What is this rate? So Ram Weiss, uh, is an Israeli guy, he did a study of about 120 obese teenagers, followed them up between 20 to 30 months. Okay? Now, one quarter of these people progressed to type 2 diabetes in just two years to three years. About 30% stayed the same, IGT, and about half of them reverted to normal glucose tolerance. But remember, one quarter of those picked up as IGT over a two-year period progressed to diabetes. And of the, of the three quarters who were not IGT at the beginning, after two years, another 10% of them became IGT. Okay? How about my own country? Well, about 10 years ago, uh, my colleagues actually did a study of 200 fat children from Singapore, we have our school health service. And we also found about the same. About one-fifth of the fat kids had glucose intolerance, mainly IGT, but we also had about 5% type 2 diabetes. And these people were mainly asymptomatic, and most of the time, the fasting glucose was normal. You could only pick them up on two-hour glucose tolerance testing, and HB1C. So if you have a family history of type 2 diabetes, that's bad news for you. Because if you have a family history, there's about two times or more risk of getting diabetes compared to other people, right? If you've got two parents with type 2 diabetes, it's actually 60% by 60 years. So given the high rates of prevalence of type 2 diabetes in India among the adults now, you know, I, I'm really fearful for the next generation, right? And if you've got monozygotic twins, it's, it's very high. So there's a genetic component, there's a familial component, there's an epigenetic component. And if you look at other countries like South, Afri uh, South America, uh, sorry, the South Pacific Islands and um, the Pima Indians, you find that within a few generations, you can get a lot of diabetes very, from a very low prevalence rate in the community to a very high prevalence rate simply through the cycle of childhood obesity, impact glucose tolerance, uh, followed by gestational diabetes, 
followed by the effects of gestational diabetes. I'll show you in a few more slides. Now, going back to the US again, the Today study was an attempt to look at about 700 kids from all over the US to see what type 2 diabetes was like. Um, this is about 10, 15 years after the initial descriptions of type 2 diabetes in America. And they found in this cohort that at entry, two-thirds were female, right? So same pattern in India, same pattern in Singapore, same pattern in the US. More females. Mean age was only 14 years, okay? They were fat because the BMI was about plus two standard deviations, and 90% of them had a family history of diabetes. So you work backwards. If you've got a family history of diabetes, you're in trouble. All right? And many of these people were minorities, which is a proxy for saying that they had a lower social uh, economic status and income. All right? Sorry, it's a double slide. And you notice that at baseline, these people already had hypertension, high-risk LDL, microalbuminuria. These guys had complications at the start. And within a few years, because they were followed up for between two to six years, your retinopathy was 14%, your microalbuminuria was 16%, your high-risk LDL was 10%, your hypertension was one in three. These kids had not even gotten to the stage where they can vote and have driving license, right? So can you imagine as they grow older? So the complications and comorbidities are similar to those seen as an adult, but on an accelerated timeline. And further, they noticed that the deterioration in glycemic control was associated with a rapid loss of beta cell function, not worsened insulin sensitivity. So it wasn't about them becoming fatter, but it was about the pancreas not working so well. Okay? And also, if their parents actually had diabetes or hypertension or depression, the kids did not go so well. If the parents were fatter, the kids did not go so well. If you look at the serious complication rate, well, there's very little to, di to, to differ between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The presence of any form of diabetic retinopathy um, in Indian young people with diabetes is about the same. It's 1 in 2, right? There's not that much difference. So even if you get type 2 diabetes as a child, it's not the milder disease because most people talk about type 2 diabetes as being the milder diabetes. Not so. How about the broader Asia-Pacific region? An older study from Singapore and, and, and uh, um, reported by Maria Craig uh, from the Asia-Pacific region. We already found 8% microalbuminuria and hypertension in a quarter of the, these people. This is an old slide. Okay, so why are we getting this? We are getting this because of insulin resistance. This is one of my little boys who started off in the obesity clinic and ended up with a diabetes, uh, diabetes clinic, right, within six years. He was just a fat little boy in kindergarten. By the time he was in secondary school, he was diabetic. So, we have heard about the Barker hypothesis. Yes, born small, more likely to get diabetes. What does this mean for India? Well, you look at the studies from the Dutch famine winter. Whoever was exposed to famine in just in, during pregnancy, uh, during gestation, you had differing patterns of glucose intolerance, but it was a lot of glucose intolerance, okay? No time to go into this. But it wasn't just the Dutch famine. China in the Great Leap Forward in the 60s under Mao Zedong, actually experienced great famine when centrally planned economies didn't quite work out in terms of producing food for the people. And they found that actually adults exposed in fetal life to uh, famine had a greater risk of metabolic syndrome later on. And if you grew fatter as a child, you had greater risk of diabetes. Now, I'm happy that in the 10, 15 years since I first came to India, I see greater prosperity all around. And that's unfortunately also means fatter Indians all around. But you all know that many actually had made the hard climb from village India to urban India. So actually, you fall into this group. Okay? Maybe not famine, but many in India were born with growth restriction in utero. Now, actually, a lot of this work was done by uh, the, the people who studied the Pima Indians. 
and, and Paul Zimmet who studied uh, the South Pacific Islanders. Born small, born in a very rural uh, um, uh, community, if there are high rates of diabetes in your community, within a few generations, a lot of diabetes can occur in your community. You only need one generation, actually. If mother had gestational diabetes or pre-existent diabetes, by the time that you leave secondary school, one in five will have impaired glucose tolerance. And very interestingly, uh, Cho Nam Han is one of the authors of this study that was reported in 1995. He's the current uh, chair of the Western Pacific Region IDF. Right? So again, going back to, to Guangzhou, this is interesting. This study showed that if you were in university and you had higher weight, you were less likely to have diabetes in later life. How does that work? Well, actually, because it's a proxy for saying that you were actually healthier and had more weight as a little boy. So is catch-up growth good or bad? I'll finish soon. In India, one in three babies are born with low birth weight. What is the optimal growth pattern for such infants? Should we feed everybody a lot? In the West, we are now thinking that we should not have overly rapid refeeding because catch-up growth in SGA infants is linked to later health risks such as adiposity, insulin resistance, and cardiovascular disease. And what makes things worse is socioeconomic transition, urbanization, and the obesogenic environment, all of which India has. So if you look at the consequences of being born small, there are effects on body composition. You have increased insulin resistance. You have earlier puberty. You have more androgen excess syndrome. But there is actually a lot of IUGR in India, 17% or more. In fact, if you look at SGA rates and compare it with international studies, some people say half of your infants are born SGA. Sorry. And you know the, the, the usual factors uh, associated with being born small. But I want to tell you a little bit more that you may not have thought of. 400 pregnant women, 12% undiagnosed hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism can give you SGA, my friends. Okay? SGA, prematurity. So perhaps in future, thinking of prevention of diabetes and growth, B12 supplementation in pregnancy, Professor Yachnik will probably talk about this, screening for thyroid disorders, preventing SGA and IUGR, avoiding childhood obesity, and more talk about drugs. Thank you very much.